In this lecture, we will be looking at some of the deep biophysical planetary connections and how these drive change on the surface. This will take us on a journey to uncover connections at all levels, including the molecular, in the biochemistry of plant toxins, the migratory behaviours of plants and animals, and predator-prey dynamics. What we will explore are the ways that different types of connections help to sustain the resilience of ecosystems and how without them, many species are at risk. First, let me recap on our theoretical and observational understanding of how the dynamical behaviours of living organisms affect survival and evolution. The cornerstones of ecology revolve around the predator-prey cycles and the way that predation pressures changes in the, in the prey population. Classic experiments and data from the last hundred years demonstrated this coupling and its ratcheting effect. Data from the Hudson Bay Trading Company uh, on the Mackenzie River on Canadian lynx furs from the mid 1800s showed a cycle with a period of 9.63 years. This was also observed in many animal populations in North Canada. The simplest explanation for the cause of the cycle was their relationship through the food chain to the corresponding cycle in the snowshoe hare population, the dominant item of food in the lynx, coyote, red fox and fisher populations. This relationship has now, been come, to, has now come to be known in mathematical ecology as the lot of Volterra dynamics. Ecologists also saw in some systems the presence or absence of predatory species determine the entire dynamics of an ecosystem. Examples of these keystone species, as we call them, were described in marine and terrestrial systems all around the world. They either had a direct effect, such as in starfish and mussel populations, as you can see, or a controlling effect, such as sea otters controlling sea urchins. And the effect on scallops and shellfish was very well documented along the east coast of North America. Predation, then, is a vital and strong determining factor of connectedness in nature sometimes working directly, sometimes indirectly. One example of an indirect interaction is the one between beavers, leaf beetles, mediated by changing plant chemistry of their cottonwood hosts. Re-sprout growth coming out of the stumps and roots of beaver cut trees contain twice the level of defensive chemicals as normal juvenile growth. However, rather than being repelled by these defenses, leaf beetles were attracted to re-sprout growth resulting in a strong positive association between beavers and beetles. Why? Cottonwood contains phenolic glycosides. These are chemicals that are defensive against mammalian herbivores, but are sequestered and used by the beetles for their own defense. Experiments showed that beetles fed re-sprout growth were better defended against their predators than those fed non-re-sprouted growth. These ideas have created a strong theoretical and modeling basis to underpin observations in many ecosystems. And it led to an overarching idea that connectedness in nature is linked to resilience. This is the ability of systems to rebound from sudden shocks. In addition, there is an understanding that there are fast, short cycles and longer, slower cycles involved in changes in nature. These ideas were brought together by Buzz Holling in his seminal works on panarchy and resilience. And they've really helped to crystallize thinking about long and short-term dynamics as ways of explaining shifts in behavior. This has led to a search for examples in nature that display these kinds of processes and a whole field of advanced modeling, including cellular automata and agent-based models. However, there is a gap between explaining changes in the world through small sets of common variables measured in systematically all over the world and findings from case studies where many more site-specific variables are measured. Whilst many of the underlying assumptions of both types of analysis, such as homogeneity of systems, simple chains of causality, and the representative of nature are sufficient to pose fundamental problems in any overall interpretation analysis, an alternative approach is needed to bridge the two extremes and explicitly deal with uncertainty and complex causality, especially if we want to look at diversity amongst classes of attributes and configurations. This is a diversity-oriented approach using fuzzy set theory, and I use logic to construct multi-attribute configurations to assess different patterns of connections in nature. Believing this approach would be more successful in helping me understand the hidden connections in nature 
has driven me to undertake experiments, collect data, <clears throat> and observe dynamical processes in different ecosystems around the world. Over the past 40 years, I've explored a range of habitats and ecosystems. Some of the places were unknown to science, others were well-documented human ecological systems. Some are dramatic and some are hardly visible, but all have provided me with insights into understanding nature's connectedness. They're in the deep ocean and remote uninhabited tropical islands, in the highest mountains in the Himalayas, in the Arctic and the Greenland ice cap and the Rift Valley of East Africa. Some networks are driven by powerful planetary scale processes. Others show the power of the microscopic world, all underlying the connectedness of nature. So let us start out with a beautiful butterfly, the monarch butterfly. It's very famous for its seasonal migration between North America and Mexico. So sometimes in the winter, you can see it moving um, from, from the US and Canada south through California. And these monarch butterflies, they're native to North and South America. But what has happened is they spread to other warm places where a particular plant grows, the milkweed. Now, the monarch's colorful pattern makes them very easy to identify, and they use this to warn predators that they are poisonous. The poison comes from their diet. Milkweed itself is toxic, but monarchs have evolved, have evolved not only to tolerate it, but to use it to their advantage by storing the toxins in their bodies and making themselves poisonous to predators such as birds. The female monarch butterfly lays each of her eggs individually on the leaf of a milkweed plant attaching it with a bit of glue that she secretes. A female usually lays between three and 500 eggs over a two to five week period. After a few days, the eggs hatch into caterpillars. Now the caterpillars only eat milkweed, which is why the female laid her eggs on milkweed leaves. The caterpillars eat their fill for about two weeks. Then they spin their protective cases, the chrysalis, and enter into the pupa stage. After about a week or two later, they finish their metamorphosis and emerge as fully formed black and orange adult monarch butterflies. There are Western monarchs, which breed west of the Rocky Mountains and overwinter in Southern California, and Eastern monarchs, which breed in the Great Plains in Canada and overwinter in Central Mexico. In the East, if they emerge in the spring or early summer, they start reproducing within days. But if they're born in the late summer or fall, they know winter is coming and they migrate south for warmer weather up to four, up to 3,000 miles. There, they huddle together on oyamel fir trees and they wait out the winter. But once the days start growing longer again, they begin to move back north, stopping somewhere along, to, along the route to lay their eggs. Then the new generation continues farther north and stops to lay eggs again. This process can repeat over four or five generations before the monarchs have reached Canada again. In the west, Monarchs head to the California coast for the winter, stopping at one of several known spots along the coast to wait out the cold. When spring comes, they disperse across California and other Western states. So the question is, how do monarchs make such a long journey? Well, we know they use the sun to stay on course and they have a magnetic compass to help them navigate on cloudy days. And they have a special gene for highly efficient muscles, which gives them an advantage for long distance flight. But the question still remains, how is it possible that they can stop on the way and actually continue on a journey, which is multiple ge generations away from them in terms of memory? We still don't have an answer for that. But very sadly, Western monarchs have declined by more than 99% since the 1980s and Eastern monarchs by 80%. It's mainly because of the disappearance of milkweed. Milkweed, which is the only place that monarchs will lay their eggs and the only food that caterpillars eat, um, used to grow in and around agricultural crops, but the removal of milkweed from fields in recent years, as well as the increased use of herbicides and all that mowing alongside roads and ditches has really significantly reduced the amount of milkweed available. Climate change is also a concern for a number of reasons. Monarchs are very sensitive to temperature and weather changes, so climate change can affect biological processes, such as knowing when to re reproduce and when to migrate. And there are also many more extreme weather events which negatively affect their overwintering habitats, as well as the availability of milkweed in their breeding habitats. So these climate changes directly affecting their survival, too hot or too cold, and the monarchs will die. Meanwhile, other insects are responding positively to changes. Birdworm caterpillars 
are now found on the branches of northern pine forests. Um, and what they do is they eat the fresh buds off, uh, setting off a sort of epic chain of reactions. Inside the trees, chemical messages flow from the needle to the trunk, warning of the attack. And within minutes, every needle produces an insect repellent enzyme, a chemical defense to try to deter the bloodworm and its kin. But the message doesn't stop there. It pulses down to the tree's roots and then out through a hidden underground network, passing its warning to all the trees around it. This alarm bell triggers each of them to mount their own chemical defense, even trees of other species, using a sort of 500 million year old social network to keep themselves and each other safe. Unfortunately, when the budworm outbreaks occur, they are so extensive that the forests often die within two to three years. This connection between trees comes from below ground in something called, is a microbial network of bacteria and fungi. And it's now known as the mycorrhizal network or the wood wide web. In the 1990s, the world of below ground communication was barely thought about. So when I undertook research with one of my students, Ruth Hendry, I started to look at the role of memory in forests. Didn't know how it would be delivered, but I wanted to know how important it was. What we did was we studied the behavior of a 500 year old mosaic cycle in the beech forests in Southern Germany. What we found was that the stress of heat stroke could cause the death of a beech tree. And when it fell down, it left a gap. That meant that the next beech tree was also exposed to sunlight. But without some kind of memory, the pattern that emerged in the forest would have been completely random. However, when our models were run with memory embedded in them, we could actually see the pattern emerging, showing a succession of gap, birch trees, mixed forest, early beech and elderly beech. What we could observe was the dominant role of memory. And this served to amplify the clumping mechanisms, such as radiation and early colonization, and kept randomization through death by senility at bay. Now the adaptive behavior of trees and other plants can be altered when linked to neighboring plants by a mycorrhizal network. So what this does is it can lead to mycorrhizal fungal colonization or interplant communication. This happens via the transfer of nutrients, defense signals or allelochemicals. These behavioral changes in ectomycorrhizal plants depend on environmental cues. They also depend on the identity of the plant neighbor and the characteristics of the, neighbor, of the network. So the hierarchical integration of this phenomenon with other biological networks at broader scales in forest ecosystems and the consequences when it is interrupted indicates that kind of underground tree talk is a foundational process in the complex adaptive nature of forest ecosystems. For decades, selflessness exhibited in new social insect colonies where workers sacrifice themselves to the greater good has been explained in terms of genetic relatedness. It was called kin selection and it was a really kind of neat solution to the conundrum of selflessness in what was supposedly an animal for itself evolutionary battle. One early proponent was now the legendary Harvard biologist, E.O. Wilson. He was the founder of modern sociobiology. But then Wilson and colleagues show the limitations of kin selection theory to explain the evolution of use sociology, the use sociality. According to the standard metric of reproductive fitness, insects that altruistically contributed to their community's welfare did not do so for themselves and they didn't rep reproduce. So they had a reproductive score of zero. Therefore, they shouldn't really exist, except as aberrations. But they're common and their colonies are incredibly successful. Only 2% of insects are eusocial, but they account for two thirds of all insect biomass. Kin selection made sense of this by targeting evolution at shared genes and portraying individuals and groups as mere vessels for those genes. Before long, kin selection was a cornerstone of evolutionary biology and it was invoked to help explain social and cooperative behavior across the animal kingdom, even in humans. But kin selection um, is a problem because it simply doesn't fit the data. Now, at first, use sociology, sociology was seen only in insect species whose reproductive biology makes fertilized eggs grow into females and unfertilized eggs into males. As a result, sisters share more genes with each other than their offspring. So through a kin selection lens, use sociality makes sense. Sisters are driven to work for each other, not their less related offspring. But 
then Eusus yarzu was found in other insect species, in termites, aphids, along with snapping shrimp and naked mole wraps, in which siblings were no more related to each other than to their offspring. So the correlation between high genetic relatedness, inclusive fitness in the kin selection argo, and new sociality was no longer held. Then came along a paper by Martin Novak and by Wilson, and what they found was that, well, they ran lots and lots of mathematical models to try to uh, look at the gap and concluded that inclusive fitness theory only applied to a very small set of all the possible models. Outside of that subset, it didn't work. So they thought about an alternative theory. It was based on standard natural selection, but it had a twist. So after starting with a focus on a single founder, they saw that selection would move to the level of colony. From this perspective, a worker ant is something like a cell, part of a larger evolutionary unit, not a unit unto itself. Their model proved that looking at a worker ant and asking why it is altruistic was the wrong level of analysis. The important unit is the colony. So starting out with solitary insects near to food sources, they develop genetic mutations that cause them to feed its offspring rather than letting them fend for themselves. This progressive provisioning is widespread in insects. After this, offspring that stayed near the nest rather than leaving would instinctively recognize that certain things needed to be done and do them. This can be seen in the real world when two normally solitary wasps are put together. If one builds a hole, the other puts an egg in it. The other sees the egg and feeds it. The team hypothesized that this would be enough to form a small but real colony, and from there, eusociality could emerge from an accumulation of mutations that led to a hyper-specialization of tasks, limited reproduction through queens alone, and favored the colony's success above all else. So within this colony, a queen would be analogous to a human egg or sperm cell, the unit that embodies the whole. Worker self-sacrifice is no more nonsensical then than that of a white blood cell. In our next stop, we see this in real life. We go to East Africa and to the Rift Valley, where I've been studying the Mao forest ecosystem, including the social structure of bees. These bees are nurtured by the Ogiek people, one of Kenya's oldest tribes, living in the Mao forest and other forests around Mount Ergon, near the Ugandan border. The current population of Ogiek is around 20,000, and they're divided into groups and clans. Their way of life is based on the natural resources provided by the forest. They're hunter-gatherers and apiculturalists, that means looking after bees. At one time, beekeeping was carried out exclusively by men, in particular the community's elders, who were entrusted with constructing the hives and harvesting honey without damaging the trees. The traditional hives, large cylinders of red cedar, which is a wood resistant to parasites and elements, are hung from tall trees. Today, women are also getting involved in beekeeping, but they manage top bar hives near the ground. But the men continue to practice beekeeping in the trees. They use vines to help them climb, and they burn dry moss to smoke the hives prior to harvesting the honey. The life of the Ogek is uniquely bound up with the different kinds of bees they look after in the forest. The small black African honey bees prefer the, the nectar produced by Dombea gotseni, the, the flowers of that plant, and that gives the honey collected in August its sort of characteristic whitish gray color and unique flavor. Honey harvested in December is instead slightly yellow in color and honey from February and April varies from reddish to almost black. The different types of bees are associated with different plants and flowers. So the stingless bee, Segometiat ag agosomeg, that nests in the ground, Gapsawet, known to produce sweet honey, which induces vomiting upon eating. Kipirigai is dark in color, um, and that bee is not aggressive. Nguan produces bitter honey. And Somosireg is brown in color, aggressive as well. Now there is some evidence talking to members of the tribe that the different bee types can form a network across areas of the forest, communicating with each other through variations in their waggle dance as to the direction and distance of nectar, and possibly through chemicals. The bees are then potentially connected together to behave like a superorganism. Our next stop takes us to look at another type of superorganism, the coral reefs around the remote uninhabited ocean, ocean archipelago known as the Chagos Islands in the Indian Ocean. It's known to many because of the recent ruling on the removal of the population during the 1960s 
to make way for the US military base on Diego Garcia. But it is today one of the largest marine protected areas in the world, and one which I was fortunate enough to explore during an expedition in 1996. Why is the Chagos Archipelago so important? Well, it's because many different forms of life call it home, from the coral reefs to the various species that live on more than 55 islands. It consists of five atolls, including the Great Chagos Bank, the largest atoll in the world. Its unique habitats include 66,000 square kilometers of shallow reefs, vast deep sea plains and limestone platforms, as well as 86 seamounts and 243 deep sea knolls. The tropical ecosystem enables a kaleidoscope of wildlife to thrive. As many as 800 species of fish can be found in the archipelago, including rays, skates, and more than 50 different types of shark. Around 175,000 pairs of seabirds visit the islands to breed, and the archipelago shelters populations of turtles, coconut crabs, and many species of fish, including tuna. It's also a breeding ground for many vulnerable species of wildlife and a haven worth protecting. Being free from the usual human impacts, it represents one of our most pristine marine laboratories. When humans first discovered the Chagos Archipelago in the 1700s, they introduced several invasive species, including rats, and cleared native forest and vegetation for habitation and the creation of plantations. Coconut farming ceased in the 1970s, but as a legacy of the plantation era, every island farmed for coconut had invasive rats. By managing the abandoned coconut plantations and eradicating the rats, a more natural seabird-driven ecosystem is regenerating, resulting in healthier islands and coral reefs and creating a refuge for natural biodiversity. Over the past decade, the archipelago has seen two significant episodes of coral bleaching due to extreme sea temperatures, resulting in high levels of coral death and a reduction in how well the reefs function. The, 19, the 20 sorry, 15 ocean heat wave unfortunately killed 60% of the hard corals at depths of up to 10 meters across the archipelago, with some species more affected than others. For example, 86% of Acroporus corals, previously the most abundant, just simply perished. Before corals were given a chance to recover, another heat wave struck just one year later, and data collected from the Perispanos atoll showed that 68% of the remaining hard corals were bleached and 29% died, suggesting that 70% of hard corals were lost between 2015 and 2017 overall. Scientists, however, have now discovered that there is a direct link between healthy seabird populations on islands and key reef health indicators, such as herbivorous fish populations. What they found was that seabird densities and nitrogen deposition rates are 760 and 250 times higher respectively on islands where humans have not introduced rats. On the reefs around these rat-free islands, fish biomass and coral reef productivity is higher, with evidence that this may also provide some resilience to coral bleaching. So currently, over 50% of the islands, and that's 73% of the land mass of the archipelago, are in a degraded state, and this is resulting in a marked reduction of biodiversity in coral reefs that are less likely to thrive. But the rat eradication is already benefiting coral reef productivity and functioning by restoring that seabird-derived nutrient inputs from large areas of the ocean. Now, remaining in the ocean, we travel to the West Atlantic, where I spent many years studying the behavior and recruitment dynamics of fish populations off the coast of Canada and the USA. My job was to collect data and build models to predict the success of different species and to establish the targets for the fishing fleets. One of the commercial species I was responsible for was the semi-pelagic pollock, Polacius virens. Unlike its demersal counterparts, cod and haddock, the pollock didn't seem to fit the predator-prey model or the provisioning models of recruitment success. What made pollock different to me was its reproductive behavior, which placed mature fish in the middle of the water column, potentially exposing them, as well as their eggs and larvae, to a wide range of different oceanographic processes. In this sense, pollock behavior was a bit more like herring and sardines, but what wasn't clear to me was the extent to which predation and cannibalism 
determine the success of young fish to survive to the age of recruitment. The patterns in the fishery suggested otherwise. We didn't know where Pollock spawned, but looking at the physical world in which Pollock eggs and larvae could emerge made me think about not only small scale oceanographic processes, but also the large scale ones. Now, the largest of these in the region is the Gulf Stream. Its fast moving waters move large pelagic species such as tuna and swordfish and sharks on long journeys from the Caribbean up to the northern waters and across the Atlantic to the east. Remote sensing imagery, which had just begun to be available, uh, projected, I, I used it projected to project the movement of the Gulf Stream and the edges spinning off it to see if there was any spatial correlation with the Pollock populations. Well, there was more than a hint that this was the case. So, armed with a model and a seagoing research, research trawler, I went to sea to find out if my hypothesis was right. If we found mature fish in or near gyres and eddies that were tracking offshore, then in two to three years' time, recruitment success would be low. If we found mature fish in eddies tracking onshore, then the prediction was that recruitment would be high. We tracked the eddies, and our first success was to find Pollock spawning in the waters of a series of eddies spinning off the Gulf Stream along the continental edge. This time they were caught in the onshore movement. My prediction was that in two years' time, the Pollock stocks would be positive. This was the first time an early detection system had been used, and it proved to be successful. Subsequent surveys showed that the mere physicality of the ocean was enough to determine the annual fluctuations. Deeper underwater, along the edge of the continental shelf of Canada at more than 1500 metres, lies a different world, a world of canyons and wide open spaces. In successive research surveys, we found different species were concentrated in different areas with very little overlap. For example, in the Carson Canyon, out on the edge, we found the major concentrations of surf clams. To the north were the northern shrimp, and even more interesting was the discovery of recovering populations of halibut. Now, in the early 1990s, the Northwest Atlantic Ocean underwent a massive fisheries-driven ecosystem shift, primarily due to overfishing in the cod stocks. Even today, the iconic cod remains at low levels, whilst Atlantic halibut has begun increasing since about the mid-2000s, along with an increasing interest from the fishing industry. Knowledge about the halibut ecology is limited and the lack of recovery in other collapsed groundfish populations has highlighted the danger of overfishing local concentrations. But looking at the spatial structure of juvenile Atlantic halibut over 36 years and three fishery management regimes, it's possible to characterize the persistence, the connectivity and the spatial variance. Two areas of high juvenile abundance persisted throughout the three decades whereas two in the northeast are now diminished, despite the increased abundance and landings throughout the management units. Now, the persistent areas overlap with seasonal closures, which, may, which really does mean they may be acting as refuges. But what was really interesting was that the connectivity between these two was estimated at around about 250 kilometers. But this is an order of magnitude less than the distance assumed in the definition of the Canadian management units. And what this tells us is that there's a smaller scale of coherent temporal patterning and that this is a much more complex population structure than previously thought. So clearly these two units are connected and supporting each other. So with fisheries in mind, um, we're now going to go back onto land and further to the east on Kalalit or Greenland as it is in the Western language, um, I spent 10 years exploring and mapping some of the largest impacts of climate change on Earth and the impacts it was having on the natural world. The surface of the ice these days is littered with blue lagoons of melting water as summer temperatures are rising to as high as 26 degrees centigrade. But it's the impact on nature in this natural deep freeze which is interesting. Polar bears, seals, narwhals, they're all affected by the melting sea ice. My Inuit tracker said that looking at the melting ice was like the melting of his heart. He felt it so deeply. The impact on animal life couldn't be clearer. Historically, the local hunters would be given a license to hunt a polar bear because it's so dangerous only one or two men would set out on the hunt. But as the ice has begun to melt, these hunts are, getting, are becoming fruitless. And now, along with the melting sea and land ice, is the growing evidence of the impacts of pollutants being transported into the Arctic via air and ocean routes. 
agricultural chemicals, including organochlorine, uh, pesticides used in Europe and, and not in the Arctic, are present in Arctic air, water and snow, and in animals and humans at levels that give rise to considerable concern. New contaminants, flame retardants, pesticides that are now in current use, which are, are now being detected in the Arctic and their effects on different species and on the environment is becoming apparent. Birds dying from DDT and other PCB poisoning, um, but also we've got alien species appearing like king crabs following new shipping routes. And these new predators are able to, to um, um, wreak havoc on some of the populations there, like on salmon and on their, and on their eggs as they're laid in the ground. Everywhere around us, then, are examples of how the connections we see in nature are demonstrations of the deep ways in which life on Earth is connected through microscopic up to planetary processes. In the next lecture, we will explore these further. What I've tried to show in this lecture is the vast diversity of connections between organisms themselves, many of which we're still trying to understand. Even our theories still need a lot of testing. Exploration can take the form of journeys to remote and uninhabited places, but even without your immediate environment, even within your immediate environment, nature's connections can be a fascinating world of inquiry. I want to end in a place where we can still get a picture of what Europe was like hundreds of years ago. The Bialowice Forest UNESCO World Heritage Site on the border between Poland and Belarus. It's an immense range of primary forest including both conifers and broadleaf trees, covering a total area of 141,000 hectares. Situated on the watershed of the Baltic Sea and the Black Sea, this boundary forest, transboundary forest, is exceptional. It's actually home to 30% of the world's wild populations of bison. It's also home to um, 250 bird species, 13 amphibian species, a huge diversity of fungi and saprolithic saprozylic uh, invertebrates, seven reptile species, and over 12,000 invertebrate species. Most importantly, it's the largest area of old growth forest characteristic of Central European mixed forests, so the sort of terrestrial ecoregion. And as a consequence, there is a richness in deadwood standing and on the ground. Most important though, are the large numbers of complete food webs, including viable populations of mammals, large and small, and large carnivores such as wolf, lynx, and otter. And it is here that we observe how connectedness in nature is what gives it resilience and adaptability. Let me leave you with a film I made while I was at the European Environment Agency as part of a series of short documentaries called The Environmental Atlas about Europe. As the park warden Martin says, you do not need to know everything to see the beauty. I hope you enjoy it and I look forward to speaking to you very soon in the future at the next lecture. Thank you. Six hundred years ago, first royal hunting took place in the Białowieża forest, and from that time, Polish kings started to take care about this forest.
can see a ecosystem which is function without human touch. Here you can see some other kind of organism, which is beautiful. We don't know, we don't have to know everything to see a beauty of them. <laughs> 